Our adventure begins in the island nation of Erytheos, a newly formed country in the southern reaches of the continent of Roria, where nearly 164 years have passed since the events of our last campaign and the prophesied battle between the end of days and salvation, now marked by an unmoving blackened scar in the sky. Here, four travelers cross paths in a faded meeting as fighting erupts in the Sapphire Port. With the help of the Port Guard, Valoth the Elven Wizard, Odd the Asimar Bard, Drizad the Dragonborn Cleric, and Flora the Eladrin Druid, successfully fend off the self-proclaimed Crest Breakers, but not before they steal away with 100 obsidian weapons that arrived on a ship after Drizad and his clan were tasked by the leadership of Erytheos to make them. After being informed that the order of these weapons was in fact a forgery, and fearing that the weapons themselves may fall into the wrong hands, the adventurers set out from the wealthy island of Anir, across the massive bridge of Narethus, towards the impoverished and more dangerous island of Tethys in search of the Crestbreakers a rebel group aiming to restructure the oligarchy of Erytheos. But just shy of the island, the party stumbles their way into a vast underworld hanging beneath the bridge, miles above the sea, called the Iron Fair. Here they meet a mentally unstable halfling rogue named Del Nathania, or D for short. Looking for answers, D leads the party to a contact that he has within the Iron Fair, a tabaxi woman named Luciana, where the party learns about the various factions throughout the city, all vying for power and influence over the others. First, the Council of the Tides, an oligarchy that governs Erytheos and is centered on an ear. Five individuals hold seats on this council, but none of them seem to represent the interests of the Commonwealth, the poverty-stricken people of Tethys. This is where the Crestbreakers take up their plight. This faction promotes a peaceful movement in protest to the government and aims to instill representation within the oligarchy or do away with it entirely. Finally, a crime ring operates behind the scenes in three different branches. The Skiff Rippers, a group of rowdy bandits, the Shroud, a band of thieves and smugglers, and the Depths the enigmatic assassins and secret keepers. All this in mind, they learn that the Crestbreakers have wrongly been accused and are likely an innocent scapegoat for one of the other criminal groups. And so the five adventurers slip even further into the Iron Fair and discover the layer of the depths in a bid to find the truth. New information from this endeavor leads the party to an intense battle with a Cyclops in the hideout of the muscle-headed Skiff Rippers. Here, their leader, Leonidas, points the party in the direction of a man named Phaedron, a wealthy merchant that leads the Shroud, the thieving third branch of the Erythaean crime ring. Finally, the mystery becomes clear to the adventurers as they pursue Phaedron and aim to prove the innocence of the Crestbreakers in the process, as D stays behind to keep an eye on the Skiff Rippers. A short while later, the party is joined by a mysterious and headstrong elven paladin named Tristan who helps them to storm the Shroud's hideout on Tethys and ultimately come away with enough evidence to bring their accusations against Phaedron at the coming Equinox celebration with all five members of the oligarchy in attendance. But seeking to hedge their bets, the party sneaks back onto the island of Anir in order to meet with Orlaith, a member of the oligarchy who may be in danger of Phaedron's scheming. In the dead of night, they are unknowingly led into a trap where Luciana, the tabaxi woman from the Iron Fair, reveals herself as a member of the Shroud before defeating and imprisoning the party with the assistance of several corrupt guards and Phaedron himself. But at the very last moment, the party escapes their imprisonment and arrives at the Equinox celebration to confront Phaedron in front of the council as a storm gathers overhead. Just as Phaedron's foul deeds are brought to light, the equinox occurs. Time seems to slow as the radiant sun slips beneath the fathomless abyssal scar, a rift of eternal night. Like a wave, a veil of obscurity unfurls across the heavens, engulfing the world in a shadowy embrace. 
when sun's light finally returns, Phaedron lies dead before the party and rises in undead form, clutching one of the obsidian weapons that the party set out in search of. A battle ensues as numerous shades descend upon the wealthy innocence at the Equinox celebration, and in revealing his true identity as a weaver, a holy warrior from the land of Benara, Tristan fells Phaedron one last time as the shades disappear along with the obsidian spear he wielded. With this dark thread of fate severed, Tristan bids farewell to his battle-weary companions as they are left to unravel what remains of this mystery. Tasked by the other two still living members of the oligarchy, Orlaith escorts Valoth, Odd, Grizzad, and Flora to Phaedron's home and office, where they discover the forgery kit used to falsely order the obsidian weapons as well as incriminating notes on various shipments of contraband in and out of the Sapphire port. With all this and a cryptic note written in an unknown language that suggests Phaedron worked at the behest of some other vile entity, the party sets sail aboard Orlaith's ship, the Ripple Dancer, in pursuit of the obsidian weapons that have now been smuggled out of Erethaos. Their destination set to Nyvira, the capital of the Grixton Republic. Orlaith asks only that they make contact with her granddaughter, an understudy of a great inventor that works within the city. But the seas are treacherous, and the Ripple Dancer finds herself under siege by the Skiff Rippers and their leader Leonidas on only their second day of sailing. Though the fight is won, the ship is immobilized just off the coast of the peninsula of Zashitan, a mysterious country of dense jungles and inhospitable wildlife from where Flora hails. Reluctantly, the party is forced to go ashore and look for some way to reconstruct a makeshift mast, but the dense and poisonous vegetation makes this difficult to do unnoticed, as they ultimately make contact with some unseen aggressor. As they stand in the midst of a flurry of disturbed spores, their vision becomes blurred and their consciousness fades. And now the mysteries of Zashitan await as the adventures continue in our 11th episode of Legacy of the Ashen.